Okay, so now we're going to be looking at asset protection. And as I put it, keeping your assets on the lock and key. Now, I've already spent a fair bit of time explaining about companies and trusts, which are the main vehicles we use for asset protection. So I'm more just going to go through some of the foundations and the theologies and how we do this to make sure that basically no gold digging scumbags can get hold of your assets. Do we need to protect our assets? Oh yes. Oh yes we do. Lawsuits are increasing daily. New South Wales is the world's second most litigious state. Victoria is um, fairly high too. I know Queensland is number five. The probability of a lawsuit on average, according to statistics, is three times in your life. 2004, average lawsuit 1.8 million. 2006, 61% succeeded. Pretty high? Quite alarming. So basically, I say the moment you get make wealth, it's not a question of if you're going to be sued or have a risk of being sued, it's when. Remember something too. Most lawsuits settle out of court or don't even go there. It's the threat that gets action happening. I don't... Jamie, I know to 21st century, they've certainly had their moments. We've certainly had our moments. I had, I've had a couple of moments myself where I've had that happen and one of them we got struck out straight away because I had no ground, but I got sued for a rather ridiculous frivolous but still got sued. It was struck out, which means the judge said it had no merit whatsoever and just struck it out and didn't even let it go to trial. And the other one was, um, was a very small amount, but the guy was determined in the end we'd just settle even though we disagreed. So at the end of the day, lawsuits are a fairly big issue you've got to face in business and the moment you start building wealth. This is, what's, this is what starts to now come onto our labels and into our, to, because of um, lawsuits and people's fears of them. Do not eat on the Apple iPod. Do not use while sleeping on a hairdryer. This product is not intended for use as a dental drill on electric rotary tool. Do not eat on toner, on a toner cartridge for laser printer. And I've, I also have seen things like on a Superman costume, not suitable for flying. So there's a, it sort of got a little bit insane. There's things now where you see warning signs like at beaches where you see rocks everywhere. Warning, do not go and stand on the rocks and jump off and dive. You may hit your head on the rock. And I mean, in other words, it's got like that. We're virtually saying to people, we think you're idiots and we're going to have to treat you like idiots because the court basically treats you like idiots anyway. So, examples. Well, I can give you a few different examples. of. Um, there's one very famous one in the US of McDonald's being sued because a girl walks in there, she basically got burnt of a hot coffee cup and McDonald's were understandably surprised considering that the girl had thrown the coffee cup and the coffee at her boyfriend in an argument and stormed off and then came back and 30 seconds later to remonstrate with him, slipped and got injured. She sued McDonald's and basically won. So you have things like that. You have situations where, like in New South Wales, a burglar getting locked in a, in a garage for eight days and then basically, because it was remote and had security locks, and then he sued the householders for imprisonment and kidnapping because they were away for eight days on a holiday. And they didn't, of course, they were away for a whole two weeks. Came back, he was starving for eight days in there and he sued him and he won the case. And then a manager who protected his family in a nightclub when he found some guy having broken into his house to try and get to the nightclub in for free, he beat up the guy and basically the guy sued him for assault and he won. So understand that lawsuits are no longer based on any sense, they just happen. I had a very, I had a, a colleague of mine who used to do email marketing and used to spam, admittedly, before the spamming laws came out. When it came out, he stopped doing it. Government went after him because some of his clients um, were still based on the old spamming list and um, they argued that he should have gone through all of his 100,000 names and, and try to work out which ones were spammed and which one wasn't. He said, yeah, right. I mean, I can't do that. They can always unsubscribe. And he got held guilty and fined $5 million. And to make an example of him, four million through his company, one million in his personal name. Fortunately, um, the company was set up in such a way of asset protection that the fine basically virtually vanished because he just wound up the company. And the remaining one million, he ended up getting a settlement from what I understand. So asset protection can save you a lot of money and save you your family's future. Insurance may not cover you as well. Just understand that insurance policies certainly do not always come through. You've got um, all kinds of indemnities in them, exclusions, 
I mean, I, I have no doubt, but most of you have not read your insurance policies and have no idea what's in there. And just like you are with most laws at the mercy of the insurance companies. So believe me, um, have, you know, my former wife um, worked for an insurance company and believe me, um, there was plenty of situations where claims got declined. So things like fine print, duty of disclosure. Um, so fine print, there's, there's, there's things like you, you have to actually disclose to the insurance company um, everything that's relevant to them giving you the insurance and if you don't disclose everything to them, then they can refuse to pay out your claim in part or in full. So for example, not disclosing all your speeding fines, things like that, they can all potentially affect your claim. So understand that insurance is anything but certain to cover you. It's important to have it, but you've got to have other things other than just insurance. And I've just mentioned briefly criminal negligence, which means if your negligence is so severe what you do, like let's say that you are warned three times about a hole in the carpet and you kept not fixing it and then someone slipped, the public liability insurer, if they found out, would probably argue criminal negligence and therefore exclude the policy. Okay, so... Employees can be sued also. Low risk, by the way, not a big issue, but just be aware if you are an employee and think it doesn't apply to me, you can actually be sued at common law. And I'm telling you that's true because it happened to me. That was the one that got struck out of the court, but I was sued actually as an employee at common law of a company, not in business. <coughs> Creditors and taxes. You can be liable for business debts of other people. Let's say that you go into partnership with somebody or go into a company. You're liable. If, they, if your business partner is left in charge of all the group tax GST, doesn't pay it, Eight months later you find out there's 85 grand going and you can't pay it, guess what, they're after you. You have to pay it. So you can become responsible for somebody else's debts without even meaning to. And tax audits, of course, I've given you a, a very clear example of um, where the ATO just changed their mind and effectively changed the law by changing policy. And bankruptcy laws, clawback periods, Intention to defeat creditors. So things like bankruptcy laws as well means you can actually claw back. So even if you, um, let's just say you, you transfer your properties into a trust um, or transfer um, shares into a trust or whatever else, the bankruptcy trustee can claw back up to four years. And if, there's, if it can prove an intention to defeat creditors, an unlimited period of clawback. So the sooner you start your asset protection strategy, the better. So what do we do? The simple way, I'm just going to give you a simple couple of examples here. The straw man and the person of substance. Very simple way to explain what this is, is fuss. Let's say you've got Dr. Steve and his wife, um, Sally. Let's say that Steve is a doctor. Sally stays at, stays at home. Okay. Who's the one at risk of being sued here? Clearly Steve. So therefore, who should control the assets, really, um, Steve or Sally? Sally, because she's not at risk of being sued. By contrast, Steve should be the one who puts his name on any documents where they can be sued because he's at risk anyway. So the idea is Sally must be kept isolated from all risk. My brother-in-law, for example, and his wife are the other way around. My brother-in-law stays at home and looks after their two children. And my sister actually works as a barrister, um, criminal barrister over in West Australia. So their situation would be the reverse. My sister would be the one who should be put a name on everything and my brother-in-law should be the one who controls all the assets. So you ask, what about situations where I'm single or what about situations where both of us are at risk? Well, you're best off in that situation to at least separate your risk from each other. So if one of you gets sued, you only lose that part of the assets. The other ones actually keeps theirs. So at the very least, even if you um, both you are at risk, well, for goodness sake, have separate trust, separate your risk from each other. So then, let's say your business goes down, like let's say in this case, Steve and Sally are both in business. Let's say Steve gets sued and he goes down, Sally still keeps going and, and her assets and everything else remain intact so they can continue on without going broke. So companies and trusts and things like that are very powerful. So when the straw man thing doesn't work, um, because 
you know, you haven't got the two parties, just use companies and trusts. A very good example there, which I've already mentioned. Example two, Jenny is a, a single and runs a financial planning company about staff. She is a straw man and person of substance here. So the problem is here, she can't do the other strategy, but she can set up a company, at least if she has her financial planning run through some kind of company. If anyone sues the company, well, the risk remains in the company, the company goes down, but her assets remain safe, provided she hasn't breached any fundamental duties as a director. So Sally would do that. And Sally would also ensure, because she runs a risky business, that she owns her properties in a trust over here. So let's just say in this situation here, Jenny um, runs a financial planning company. She should have the company running over here. That ensures that the business goes broke, the company goes down, her credit rating is safe. She has a trust which owns her property and she has another trust which owns all her investments. Bang. All makes sense? If Jenny started another business, let's say she started a further company in wholesale products, for example, that would be a separate company again to ensure that if that business got sued, that one's okay. If that gets sued, that one's okay. Make sense? So the idea is separation of risk. That's the thing to remember at all times. Multiple structuring. So in other words, the more structures you've got for the more assets, the better. The, m the less risk you have. I say you separate trust for personal business and investment. One quick thing I'll mention here too is um, let's just say that um, Sally is actually going to build a really valuable business. Let's say that Sally has a mortgage broking company. She plans to expand it, franchise it out, go really massive. Then Sally might have a mortgage broking company here but she might set up a trust over here that owns all of her branding and her names and that licenses it there. Why? If someone sues her over here, the, the mortgage broking goes down, that one remains intact, she can just set up a new company and start afresh. Pretty cool? So just some very useful little strategies here which you can do and which we do all the time for our clients. The other one here is um, set up bank accounts properly. Um, just one thing I've mentioned here, example, lady doctor makes $250,000, 100,000 for employee husband, lady doctor is by far at risk of being sued, bankruptcy you can trace money back. So the employee husband in basically does all the investing, why? Because if she gets sued, and they try to trace the money back, her money's all gone on household expenses, mortgages, everything else. His money has gone into savings, cash, investments, everything else. So that's just another layer of protection if you really want to get a little bit more detailed. In practice, the bankruptcy trustee doesn't go that deep, but they may do if you've got enough money. So that just makes things a little bit more tighter if you really want to make sure you're covered. What if you're wrongly set up? Well. You can transfer assets to a trust or whatever else. Problem with that, stamp duty, capital gains tax. Number one, no, for, for starters. Number two, you still have bankruptcy clawback. So people say, Warren, can I transfer my house into a trust? Well, yes, but you'll pay capital gains and stamp duty possibly, and you'll certainly be up for a four to five year clawback anyway. So what else can you do? You can, you cross collateralize or use finance company. In simple terms, what I'm saying is this. Using Sally again, Sally is a doctor, she's running, a, she's single, she's running a business, but she's majorly at risk. Sally's very concerned about the fact that she's got four properties in her own name. She could transfer them all into a trust and be up for about a couple of hundred grand or more in stamp duty capital gains, maybe quite a lot more, or Sets up a finance trust and through a series of, of properly done transactions, which I won't, you know, confuse you now, but just get the concept, money ends up going from the properties, let's say the properties are worth three million, and let's say the um, debts say only five hundred thousand dollars. Sally effectively borrows or finds ways to get money off the line of credit, puts the money into the trust, 
and then as a gift and then borrows the money back. And has mortgages over the properties. The moment she does that, it means anyone trying to sue sees that all the properties have got two mortgages, the bank mortgage, and it's got also further mortgages from the XYZ Finance Trust over here. So what you're effectively doing is rather than transferring the properties into a trust, Sally is actually setting up a finance trust, getting money out of her line of credit or her houses, plonks it into the trust and then basically borrows it back. And by doing that, she effectively increases the debt. Let's say the debt goes up to $2 million. It now means anyone wanting to sue her is not going to be attracted to suing her. Why? Because they get $3 million after all the costs, the fact that, the, that when they do a foreclosure auction or quick sale auction, there's no way they'll get $3 million. Bucks. They'll be lucky to get $2 million. Basically, they'll get, no, they'll get nothing. The money will all end up basically going straight over to Sally's companies and to the bank. Pretty good. And again, are there ways to crack through that? There are, but asset protection is about smoke screens. And in practice, you're making it as hard for people as you can. And the more layers you've got, the harder it is to crack. So it's a bit like a fortress, like who's seen Lord of the Rings here? Have you? Yeah, Lord of the Rings, you've got the fortress and the more layers and the walls there were, the harder it was to get in, in a fortress. So think of it like a fortress, you're building your wealth fortress. So the more layers by insurance, by having these mortgages, whatever else, the harder it is for anyone to basically have a dig at you and crack onto your assets. Now, people say to me, well, Warren, it's great. What about the family court? I mean, my wife and I are separating, and what if we separate? I mean, that's great, but my wife's got all her assets in her name, but she walks out on me, great. She now owns everything. Well, the family court have huge powers to break through trusts and companies. I always say, ignore anything I've said today to do with family court. Family court can just override everything we've talked about. So what you do with family court is get what's called a prenup or binding financial agreement. That's where you can basically sign something where you come to some kind of agreement. Not as watertight as America, you need to upgrade and renew them pretty regularly every three to four years, um, possibly or at least every five years, because after five years the courts take them less seriously and tend to say, well, Situation's now changed. We don't really think that the agreement is relevant anymore. Also with trust, just be aware of a couple of decisions that have come out, which I won't go into detail, but these decisions have cast a little bit of weakness on trusts. They still don't take away the ability to use trust, but you must be a little bit more careful now how you use your family trust. So whereas before, things are pretty clear. Now, although we still have great power, just how you precisely structure your trust, who's the appointor, who's the trustee, is critical now. So if you're going to be setting up asset protection properly for your business, personal affairs, you really want to you know, do it properly and get it structured with the right parties involved. So in summary, whatever you do, don't hold assets in your own name with the possible exception of the family home. And don't do business without a structure. But don't do investment without a structure either. So that's what you don't do, or at least some planning around the structure. By contrast, do use your trust for business and investment. Use multiple trust structures. Use your superannuation fund to build retirement wealth. So in summary, use structures as much as you can. These times they're not appropriate because it will cost you capital gains, stamp duty. Um, it may end up being too costly for you to run because you're too small but at least get proper advice and make sure you get a plan that's going to work for your situation. And look, please note, this is not about avoiding legitimate obligations. I really stress that, hey? There's a lot of way of getting out of moral responsibilities which you just decide you don't want to pay. Make sure you're using it just because you're having the power of choice because let's say you got landed in a bad situation, you've tried everything to get out of it and you just realise, well, I've done as much as I can. I need to have another go and move on or these tax debts I just can't meet. So the idea is more to protect you to give you a start to have another go in life. Superannuation, I'm just going to touch, I've covered the main gist of the day now in tax asset protection. I'm now going to briefly cover a little bit on super, a little bit on estate planning, a little bit on offshore and also a little bit on global challenges and just some of the things I just want to make us aware of is what's going on. Super. 
Sleep plays a very important part of building your long-term wealth. Very important part. 93% of Australians, they've estimated, do not have enough money for their retirement. Pretty shocking, isn't it? It's about empowerment responsibility. So superannuation, I'm very big on making sure you have your superannuation working for you or at least in a fund, a self-managed fund of some kind if you're actually investing it yourself. The advantages of a self-managed fund, one is empowerment, you take control. So rather than say, a self-managed fund, by the way, is a fund that you are managing yourself. So rather than AMP, AXA, um, Bankers Trust or some other, um, or Uni Super running it for you, you have your own self-managed fund and that runs it for you. So you can invest in share lord, you can invest in property through it, you can buy shares, you can buy artwork, you can buy wine. You can basically become your own investor for your retirement rather than depending on a super fund working on archaic investment stuff for you. So you take compound control, great tax savings in super, um, increased returns potentially if you know what you're doing. I do say this about self-managed funds. If you're a good investor, you'll be very happy you did it. If you're an idiot, you'll just end up losing your money. Whereas at least with a fund manager, they'll make you some money, in theory anyway. So if you're going to be doing a self-managed fund, make sure you are self-managing it. Don't just set something up and leave it. You must make sure you are self-managing the fund. Asset protection as well. Assets in there are protected from bankruptcy. And you're basically getting yourself a pension locked in for retirement. Remembering that after 60, you pay no tax on super. On money, on earnings that you do and pensions being drawn out. So pretty much you can pull money in and out and save an absolute fortune. You can contribute um, up to $25,000 a year as in business into superannuation tax deductible. 50,000 if you're um, over 50 for a couple more years yet. And you can basically give up to 150000 a year or 450000 over three years in what's called a non-tax deductible contribution. So in other words, you can put money into superannuation and basically start building a retirement platform to invest and build yourself wealth. And let's just say you find a strategy that makes you 10, 20% per annum, you've got a million dollars in super or $500,000, well, potentially that's a 50 to 100 grand um, income a year, tax-free, which isn't too bad. Disadvantages, well, empowerment also means you are now responsible, you can't just leave it passively. Definitely more costs to run one, so you've got to make sure the returns are worth it. The monies must stay in until retirement. A lot of people make the mistake of thinking, great, self-managed fund, I can now pull the money out, I can buy this, buy that. It's still money for your retirement, and you're still subject to very, very, very strict laws. Very strict compliance rules. That's probably the big thing to be aware about. You've got what's called a sole purpose test, which means that you must make sure that every transaction for your fund is 100% for retirement. It can have no personal benefit. I'll give you an example. You buy artwork. You put it up in your home. That's a personal benefit because you actually can look at it and enjoy it. You're in breach. You buy a Ferrari, you can't drive it. You buy a Swiss chalet, you, you can't, and there's a case on this in the courts, you can't actually go and even have one day's holiday for the year because you're now getting a personal benefit. It must be for your retirement. Other people can rent it, but you can't. So it's very strict. You can't borrow in a self-managed fund except in very strict situations with property where certain property deals you can actually borrow, but you've got to have separate trust set up and all kinds of rigmarole to do it. You've got what's called in-house asset rules. You can't invest your super into a related company. I've had clients do that. So <clears throat> let's just say you've got a business and you think, okay, well, I'm doing a new business, like a 21st century business opportunity. You need 20 grand. You get your superannuation to invest 20 grand as a loan or buy shares. Can't do it. And if you get caught, it's non-complying, you'll be breached and hit with penalties. In the worst case scenario, they actually make your fund non-complying, which means 47% tax for everyone a day. It's now basically worthless. So you've just, that's the big disadvantage. Make sure you're compliant with the law. And auditors are very, very strict these days with superannuation to make sure you're following the law. 
It's very attractive since 1 July 2007. The salary sacrifice, 15% tax before 60, tax-free pensions and earnings up to 60, all self-explanatory, pretty good. It means in theory, let's just say you, um, and here's a scenario for you. Let's say you buy your business premises in a super fund, which you can do, and you can rent it back. You normally can't get a personal benefit from any asset in a super fund, but the one exception is you can buy your business premises in a super fund and rent it back. Let's say you do that, you rent it back, goes up in value, you hit 60, you sell your business premises and your business. Your business premises you sell for $800,000, capital gains tax free, because it's now in super. You sell your business for $800,000, let's say that's also capital gains tax free using exemptions. $1.6 million tax free, you effectively got a pension at even 10% per annum of 160 grand a year tax free. Pretty good. So superannuation should not be in any way ignored. And quite the contrary, you want to make it an active part of your wealth strategy. What can you do in a self-managed fund? Hang on, it's going a bit weird here, sorry. You can trade options and, and Forex and CFDs and that within limits. There are some restrictions around CFDs. You can't borrow, you can't margin, but you can basically still do it. You can buy property in your super fund, but you can only borrow within strict laws. You can invest in shares, artwork and wine, but watch the sole purpose test. And now interestingly, most accountants will tell you you can't run a business in super fund, but it's actually not true. The law is very clear you can. The problem is why would you want to do it? Because you can't touch the money until you're 60. So you wouldn't do it. I mean, you, you never would run a business for a super fund. What can't you do? You can't lend or invest in yourself, which I mentioned. Special warning on US property. Now, I know a lot of people are now investing in the US property market, and I'm hearing a lot of clients saying they'll do it through super. Now, I've spoken to an auditor only just um, a little while ago, a very, very big auditor over in Perth, and I can tell you now with US property, you've got to be very caref careful. Um, you've got to make sure your LLC structure is precise. Your LLC cannot be owned by a trust for situation. It must be owned by the members of the super fund, number one. Secondly, you can't basically have the super fund own shares in the LLC because that breaches the in-house asset rules. The super fund, the only way it works is what's called a bear trustee. So in other words, you must actually make sure that the US property, you do a bear trustee arrangement. So the LLC must be owned by the members of the super fund. And number one, so let's say you've got Dick and Dora, got a super fund, a Dick and Dora fund, two members only, because you can have up to four members in a self-managed fund. Dick and Dora would own the shares in the LLC. In fact, I'll draw it in a diagram for you, just to make this nice and simple. So you've got your super fund down here. LLC set up to buy US property. Dick and Dora are the trustees and members of your super fund. Dick and Dora would own the LLC. And the LLC would hold the properties, they it buys, as trustee for the super fund. If the super fund would not buy shares in the LLC, and I know clients for a fact are talking about buying their shares in the LLC to do it, and that's not on. So you've got to be very careful if you're investing in US property that you comply with the law. Um, you can't use it for personal use, which I've mentioned, and you certainly can't transfer personal assets into your super fund, with the exception of business real property, which means your business premises, or <coughs> listed shares is an exception. So I think you can see that super is a great benefit, but there are a lot of laws and you've got to make sure you're well and truly complying with the laws. I mentioned about borrowing money, which I want to emphasize it again, you can't do that in a super fund except for certain exceptions. Summary, set up the fund to build retirement wealth on your control and use it to full advantage. So if you're buying a super fund or you want to you, you want to invest and take charge of your own super, then do it. If you, if it basically um, if you've got the right advice, you're comfortable doing it, then a super fund is a great way to go. People ask me how much should I have before I do a self-managed fund. I say, look, ASIC say two hundred thousand dollars minimum. I say you do your numbers, work out the returns. Understand it costs about three to five grand a year to run a super fund. Three to five grand. So work out whether you're going to be making returns that are going to justify 
the extra cost. So if the returns justify it, do it. If not, generally about $100,000 minimum is, is, is needed in my view. And you've got to be making good returns to make that justified at that number. 200,000 is generally safer, but you, I have seen people do it 100,000, even 50, if the numbers actually work in the returns they're projecting to make. Okay, any questions on SEPA? No? Okay. Let's just touch on estate planning very briefly. Now, hands up if you don't have a will. Yeah, there's always normally quite a few in the room. So, wills, unfortunately, if you don't have a will, it can be a huge problem because it gives you certainty. It gives peace of mind and empowerment. But for your family, it's critical. I've seen some horrendous situations. I had a client who came years ago to me. Her husband had died. He owned a family home. Um, she wanted to get it transferred to her name. She's on a pension. Problem is, no will. So, of course, under intestacy laws, she gets 75% of the house, 25% goes to his two brothers who's got no kids. Problem is, he and the two brothers had a huge fight 25 years earlier and stopped speaking. So effectively, one fourth of the house was going to go to two brothers whom he hated and would turn in his grave if he knew of getting the house. She was going to either have to sell the house or get a loan for 25% of the amount and pay him. On a pension with Centrelink, is it easy to get loans, yes or no? No, so she basically lost her house. Pretty horrible story. That's what happens though. And they're the kind of things that can happen if you don't have a proper will. So very important. There's a lot of issues to consider too in the will which people don't tend to consider in asset protection and tax planning. One is tax. So let's just take an example. Um, let's just use Dick and Dora again. <coughs> we'll use Donald and Daisy. So we've got Donald and Daisy Duck. They've got four kids, Huey, Dewey, Louie and Spewey. And what happens with, um, with them is that Donald and Daisy die and now their four kids are getting their, their properties. Let's say for argument simplicity, they own four houses. Rather than simply getting one fourth each in the house, which is what they normally would do, the four of them just get together and say, look, let's take a house each. So they, Huey wants that house, Dewey wants that house, Louie wants that house and Spewey wants this house. Problem is what's happened? There's been a transfer because each of them only had a one-fourth interest under the will. Effectively, they've transferred their parts to each other. What does that mean? Who, who gets a share now? Taxman. Capital gain stamp duty. So you want to make sure your will structured what's called a bloodline or testamentary will that can avoid that, enable flexibility among the children to move assets between themselves. Family court. Let's say that um, Dewey is going through a really bitter divorce at the time. And... Let's just say that Dewey gets his share of the assets at the time that's going on. Dewey's ex-wife will basically get a substantial, will probably end up walking away with quite a reasonable share of those assets. So a bloodline will again make sure that bar extremely bad behaviour by Dewey, the money will stay within the bloodline and ex-wife will get nothing at all. Second marriages, will challenges, most wills don't cover for that. To give you an example, um, let's just say that you've got a second marriage and you, you want to avoid a will challenge from you know previous partner or whatever else. Here's a little trick, for example. Um, what, what, what can be challenged at law is the estate, okay? The estate. So the estate can be challenged. So in other words, any assets in the estate can be sued for or can be challenged under the will. Let's say, however, there's a separate family trust outside the will that passes control directly to the second wife. The first wife gets no control because the control doesn't happen in the will, it happens in the trust document. So the appointor of the family trust is second wife. And that owns, say, property as well. That, those assets will remain free from a will challenge because they're kept away from the estate. Who thinks that's clever? Yeah, so what you're doing is, is keeping the assets separate. So 
if you've got that situation, you certainly want to have a chat, and we've certainly got lawyers who can, who can help and look into all that for you. Bankruptcy as well. Let's just say that um, Louis has gone bankrupt at the time of um, the death. Who's going to get Louis' share of the estates, his creditors? You want your will to have a clause that clearly states that if Louis is bankrupt or any of the kids are bankrupt, the money will basically stay in a special trust hidden um, in, within the estate and, won't, and can't go to him while he's bankrupt. Only when he's out of bankruptcy he can get the money. So that, that ensures that the money will stay and be waiting for him when he gets out of bankruptcy. And finally, insurance policies, making sure your life insurance, your TPD, all that, clearly specify your estate as beneficiary if it's a, if it's a bloodline will. So you want to make sure you know who your beneficiaries are in your insurance policies. So I mentioned about the bloodline will. Simple wills are just basically where they've got no frills. None of the stuff I mentioned is covered. A bloodline will or three generational testamentary trust will is what you want. So if you've got kids that are older, if you've got a siblings, you really want to make sure it stays in the bloodline. If you've got a reasonable asset base and it's really important to you, you definitely want to get a bloodline will. Powers of attorney, very simply, let's just say that, um, you know, you've got, say, Dick and Dora again, or Donald and Daisy. Donald suddenly gets violently um, sick, he has a car crash, he goes into a coma. Who's going to sign his documents for him now? The short answer is, without a power of attorney, Daisy will have to leave his bedside, race up to the guardianship board and get a power of attorney, not knowing if he's going to live or die, as happened to one of my clients a few years ago. So a power of attorney ensures that Donald and Daisy... If Donald suddenly gets violently ill through a, an accident and Daisy has to sign on his behalf, Daisy produces the power of attorney and she signs on his behalf. All pretty clear? So that's the idea of a power of attorney, to give each other power. I'm going to briefly touch on offshore. I've already gone through it a little bit, so it's only going to be brief. The fact is, the ATO can say or anyone else all you want about barking about offshore. The fact is the world is going more online. The internet is offshore. The fact is the world is expanding rapidly. The fact is the more, you, if you get in the trading share law or anything else, you're now offshore because share is a US broker. If you're trading um, like Forex or futures, most brokers now, many of them are now offshore in Switzerland, whatever else. So the moment you actually start getting into internet marketing and selling across the world, I mean, you're offshore. So is it illegal to basically go offshore and do things offshore? Absolutely not. In fact, it's getting bigger. The more, and to be honest, I, the reason why is it scares the ATO. There's a book called The Sovereign Individual by Lord Rees, Moggs and Davidson that basically shows very clearly that the biggest fear of governments is going to end is the internet economy. And the fact that bit by bit they'll lose control over taxation and everything else through bartering and everything else. So hence they're doing everything in their power to crack down and keep control. To me, it's very similar to the record companies. The record companies who are fighting tooth and nail to stop pirating, and I've always said, it's crazy. Why don't the record companies just simply do a deal with all the sites and pay them a very small royalty and just charge small amounts for every song and just say, look, rather than try and sort of fight for that, just say, look, they'll make more money by simply getting control and just every song just gets, gets paid for. And to me, governments eventually will wake up and realise that the current approach isn't actually going to work. And there's better ways to get their share of the revenue and actually build revenue into the economy. In saying that, um, be very careful. I, I, I personally refuse to set up offshore structures for Australian residents because um, unless there's a very, very clear offshore treaty exemption, and I haven't, to be honest, done one for a long time uh, on that, um, or if there's a very clear business you're doing offshore and it's all declared on board in Australia and they know that. So the moment you're Australian resident, you pay tax on all your income, Australia, everywhere across the world. If by contrast you are a non-resident of Australia, different story, you will pay tax only on your Australian sourced income. So one time when an offshore structure will definitely help you is if you become a non-resident, like a perpetual traveller, you... Um, you know, live in another country, you trade, whatever else. Or if you live in Australia as a resident, but let's say internet marketing, I have had clients set up a, a, a US company because certain 
businesses prefer to see a US ID before they'll deal with you. There, there's nothing about tax avoidance, they pay the tax, but they use an offshore structure, plus it also makes the um, asset protection even stronger. So, nothing illegal about offshore structuring, what's illegal is setting up an offshore structure to avoid paying tax, ev evade tax basically, illegally. That's, that is completely a dumb thing to do because I don't see there's any point in basically being on the front page of the paper in handcuffs going to jail for money. There's no point, so it's a, it's a dumb thing to do, to be frank. Um, however, don't be scared off setting them up if there's legitimate need or if you're actually using them for legitimate purposes. I, I have set one up for a client before which was purely for asset protection, no tax plan. The ATO twice looked into it, to be honest. And the good thing was we had nothing to hide. We actually sat down and showed the ATO exactly what we were doing. They came back again for another look about a year later, mind you. But, I mean, we said, well, we've just told you the same things before. You can, you can do as much tracing and whatever else you want to do. There's no problem. So the key is, don't be frightened. Just know your rights, know the position, and then have nothing to hide. It's a very easy way to do business and live life. So, yep, if you're offshore connection, I've mentioned perpetual traveller, non-resident, all that kind of stuff. If you're going to become a petrol traveller or non-resident, I strongly encourage you to get advice from your accountant or lawyer or from us. We can do that for you because you need that to make sure you, you are a non-resident because the ATO have very strict rules as to what constitutes residency or not. So what don't you do? Well, obviously, don't buy an off-the-shelf overseas structure to avoid Australian tax on, on income. Don't falsify deductions in your return, blatantly lie. Oh, that's just illegally. I mean, that's just nuts. Um, Operation Wickenby, just so you know, which scares everyone, that actually was that. They were setting up companies over in Vanuatu and other ones and then charging back for services never provided and then claiming tax deductions in Australia to get the money offshore. I mean, that's just nuts. Not only not, it's not even like hiding income, you're actually falsifying an Australian tax return. So... Unfortunately, that's sort of playing with fire, and that's why a lot of people have been prosecuted and some have gone to jail for it. Okay, before I finalise, I'm just going to quickly just cover a bit more on the why and the global challenges that we're facing as I see it, with taxes and asset protection and wealth building and everything else. Really, more and more people are living... J-O-B, just over broke, a job, struggling day to day without purpose. I mean, costs of living are rising all the time. That's a fact in Australia. Um, I, when I help clients, I'm more and more shocked to see how many clients are just almost starting to rely on credit cards just to cover their expenses. So it's happening more and more. People are being overwhelmed by the system, overwhelmed by the changes in laws. And to be honest, I think what's happening, people are going, this is all too hard. And I see clients who are smart, intelligent people who are virtually on antidepressants and just saying it's all too hard. It's just, it's, this is just, it's just too hard. Their debts have grown out of control. They don't know what to do. Their mortgage is building up. I mean, very close friends of mine, a retired couple who've been wise with money, their line of credit each year goes up a certain amount because they're now living more than they can cover. So it comes, one of the biggest factors that, we all, that I really want us to, to, to see we need to get back to is a why. Because if we're going to change our, 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 our country and like the vision of 21st Century Academy to educate Australians to become financially free and to really give us a, a vision and a passion to deal with stuff in governments and things like that to build the kind of government that we want in our country for our kids to grow up in and if we want to have the kind of governments and business infrastructure we've got today to you know, give, give the goods and resources we want, it's up to us. The fact is if we don't get empowered in our financial knowledge and then get empowered in our wisdom, then things are going to keep going the way they're going. That's just a fact. Really, we need, every one of us today are accountable to, for this, for our wealth knowledge, for our tax knowledge, know this stuff, make sure we're structuring ourselves well and then being able to help and educate others because the more we're doing this, the more we're going to actually be able to start to get an impetus and, and make a difference. Without a why, we cannot impact our country, our education system, and make the difference. And every one of us has a why, a driving purpose deep in our hearts, which many of us have 
I believe, lost connection with. We spent a lot of time in the last weeks just simply going over and over and over our purpose. We've actually written a, a whole 15 pages on what's called our why in our business document now. In a whole group company expansion plans, we've actually written that out. It took me hours and hours and hours to write it with my, my business partner. But our why, and my rule of the why is what brings tears to your eyes? What's the thing that actually gives the passion that makes you want to get up and just make this happen? And that means you will not give up on your dream. Because a dream is something we're fighting for and it's something that gives you inspiration. And when things get tough, it's an anchor for the soul that keeps you moving. And especially as you start to see things changing and start to say, no, I want to be part of impacting what's happening. So I know my personal mission, which is our statement, is to educate people to prosper in all areas of life and liberate people from the system. In other words, the system of control, the system that controls us in our finances, in our health, in everything that we're doing in our tax knowledge, all that kind of stuff. So really, it's about getting a far greater purpose beyond ourselves. And when we do that, everything makes sense. For me, I, why do I do accounting? Not because I just turn up and just want to sit there and number crunch. I've got a passion to think, well, yeah, if people are going to be wealthy. They need to have good managed um, structures. They need to be managing their tax and be aware and know what's going on in the tax system. If we're going to be building wealth, we've got to be protected to make sure that what we grow and what wealth we build, we fight for and we keep. It's all meaningless, really, otherwise. And governments are restricting freedoms and regulation being increased at an alarming rate. And the individual needs to become empowered, educated and over legal rights, which is why we, I've done this legal rights course, because I'm so passionate that says, Australians, we've got to know as part of accounting and tax minimisation, national protection, we must know our legal rights because every time you get a speeding fine or parking fine or you get a tax bill or someone chases you for money, which you know is not right and fair, but it's so relentless, you just go, it's too hard. And I've got my kids are fighting all the time and my mortgage bill's gone through the roof and I've just got to go to the dentist. It's too hard. Just pay the bill. Let's just get over and done with. Stop fighting. That's, that's, that in itself erodes your wealth. It erodes your energy. Paying this $500 bill, which basically you know is not justified, but they're relentless, relentless, relentless near a big company. So it's about getting your, your rights back to protect your assets. And I mean every part of your assets. That's your assets in your finances. That's your, um, your houses, your wealth. But it's also your emotional assets, your purpose, the dream which is in you. Because ultimately, money is fantastic. Money lets us do what we're wanting. But what is money? People jump off buildings from the stock market crash in 929. People commit suicide because they lose all their money. And what does that say to us? How sad. Is our life really become so meaningless now that it's driven in a frivolous pursuit of just material things and not knowing the depths of our soul and conviction, having complete faith in ourselves and belief in our purpose that says we can, we can do this, we can achieve this dream. That when things get tough and financially things are struggling, it's like, no, I believe in myself that I can get out of this. Yes, I may have just lost, had a big crash in the markets. That does not change the fact I can make this money back. And seriously, that's the kind of mentality and passion I want to see coming back, back into, into, into all of us. Because that's what's going to start to make us a strong country and start to build us in our, in our wealth and build big wealth. Because our why will be so powerful and our passion and conviction will be so strong and our certainty not giving up in what we're about. I mean, how much do we want this? How much do we want that house on the beach? How much do we want to be able to set up that education, um, say, centre that we dreamed of, or that third world orphanage, whatever? All of us have dreams, and this is the biggest thing I want to be saying, that as we structure ourselves, we're keeping in mind why we're we doing all this, because then it becomes clear, and then we'll do it with conviction. When we do our company in trust, we'll be going, right, I want to make sure that I have a good company in trust. I want to make sure that I've got bank accounts. I'll make sure that my paperwork's in order because I want to make sure this is watertight. I want to make sure that my records are in order with my tax and my business so I know every dollar coming out of my business. When is a why, you start to start getting serious about the detail and order of, your, of, of what you're doing. The fact is a massive shift is coming in the coming years and pretty much many great people have, have, and, and economists have said some stage we've had taste for the GSC but we're going to have bigger crashes on major scales. We're seeing earthquakes, we're seeing Japan. Chances are that we'll experience a massive financial collapse at some stage at some level is, is strong. 
And we want to make sure that our foundation is strong, our monetary things, our knowledge of who we are, our knowledge of business and who we are, and the ability to have faith in ourselves that we can do business and find business that works no matter what. Because in recession, many people become far wealthier in recession than in boom. Why? Because the people who are smart and who are educated and the people who are actually absolutely conv got conviction and can see the need of the market and know how to reach people will make the money. That's the fact. So it's about being ready for all conditions. The, the true investor, true business person, the true um, speculator or whatever is going to be someone who's going to, no matter what market conditions, we're not, we're not worried. Whether it's a really good boom time, they make money. Whether it's a bust time, they're making money. It doesn't really matter because they've got the eye on the market and they've got a conviction and a passion in what they're doing. So I always say there's a spiritual purpose or deeper purpose has to drive you. I mean, no one, if we're honest, when we grow up as kids, just say, hey, all I want to do one day is make money. Very few of us do that. The dream can be as simple as I want to be this. I want to be a fireman. I want to be leader of the world one day. I want to be government leader. But all of us have a drive. And when we get into our flow and who we are, it makes a difference. And I've noticed to myself many years ago, I was doing the opposite to my flow. I was trapped in a job. I was doing things I hated doing. Suddenly now, when I started to realize my flow and live in my flow and what I was best at doing, things started to come together and things started happening for me. And every now and again, I fall out of my flow. Things happen and go wrong. I get back into my flow and things start to happen again. So we want to keep this in mind as we're building our wealth. So just here's just a quote from um, a bank president, Larry Bates, who talked about economic um, crash coming is going to be massive, but he also mentions in periods of upheaval, wealth does not destroy it, it's transferred. So wealth never just goes kaput and vanishes, it just simply transfers into the hands of people who are ready to give greater service to the world. People who see, right, we're in trouble, how can we serve the world more? For example, in, the, in, in recession, people still need food. People still need certain living essentials. People need various things. And if you actually go back over Great Depressions and find that what actually happened was many lost wealth, but certain people made incredible wealth because they were ready and they knew what, what needed to be done. I've also mentioned here, worth watching, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but Jamie does a lot of this on his, on his um, talks, but the Money Masters DVD, which is four hours, worth getting hold of, you can buy online, explains very clearly the history of money, explains clearly about how fractional reserve banking works, which Jamie goes through, how money is artificially created, and the fact that crashes are, are artificially contrived, many wars are funded, basically wars happen through basically bankers funding them because it makes them more money. There's a whole lot of this sort of stuff. So it's following the money trail, understanding this kind of stuff, but you must get a good understanding of money. And as you understand money too, you'll get a greater understanding for income tax. And understand as part of fractional reserve banking, for example, income tax is essential to reduce the effect of inflation. Now that's something I'll explain another time. But very, very simply, it's about getting our why and our purpose back and knowing what we're doing and why we're doing it. Understand we have got a system that's based on this means. We've got to know what it's about and know how to address it and know how to take on the challenges. There's um, plenty of information that the fact that the world tax system is on the way that will pretty much just tax people in their banks as it comes in, so there'll be no cash economy. One of my colleagues actually went to a conference in Mexico when he worked for the tax office and told me they openly admitted but the plan is they're working with all different European countries is to bring taxation into a one world economy and a one world taxation system. And I don't think that the taxation is going to be low. So <clears throat> I mentioned about New World Order, ultimate aims, cashless society, um, tax world domination by a few private families. Doom and gloom? No. It's just being aware of the facts and the truth and saying, well, the reason why dictators rise up in society or people get power is because people get disempowered. And so my passion is for all of us to become educated and know our finances, know the laws of finance, know the laws of health, know all this sort of stuff, because the more power we get to start to create our own wealth, and we can create this, then we start to see a change in this, and we start to see a change in our government and everything else around us, and we start seeing the kind of government and the kind of living conditions in society that we want to start happening for our kids to grow up in. 
because I'm sure we all agree, the increase in crime, what we're seeing in the schools is not exactly what we would have hoped or wanted to see our kids experience. That's for sure. I know 20, 25 years ago, um, my sister, for example, would just go and play in the park and no one even thought twice of it. Now, I know my cousins, I mean, they wouldn't even let their teenagers go anywhere, you know, their kids go anywhere near a park without being supervised. And certainly when their teenagers go out, they've got strict curfews and I know they worry themselves sick. So again, this is all, does it relate to what I'm saying? Absolutely, because part of changing things in society, the people who make the laws and who make the conditions are the people who've got the money. So the more we build wealth, the more we build power empowerment, the more we structure what we're doing and we build greater organisation in our own lives, we become a more powerful collective. So we see laws changing all the time. I mentioned about privatisation, and the fact is the more laws change, the more instability actually gets created. I mean, if every day you don't know if what you're doing in business could just suddenly be taken away from you by a law change, it's not exactly the most stable environment to be in. Evil triumphs when good men remain silent. Martin Luther King. So, just to give you an example, the tax law examples, the 1936 Act versus the Tax Act today. Um, you actually read the difference. The 1936 Act was a very small little tax act that just had a few provisions. The, the tax act now is this long. No one can possibly know it. Laws have become so complex that people have got no possibility just about of knowing it. So I just want to quickly let you have a look here at part 4A of the Tax Act and the GST legislation. I mentioned already that the ATO can undo a commercial tax, a legitimate commercial tax arrangement done by two business people can be undone as if it never existed, because the tax office decided they don't like it. Even worse, with GST, the anti-avoidance laws gives the Commissioner of Tax power to lie, effectively. Let me show you what I mean. How the tax office may do a number of things to create a GST liability. He may treat a particular event that actually happened as not having happened. Treat an event that did not actually happen as having happened, and treat the event as having happened at a particular time. So basically, he can make up a fabrication that actually suits. And thirdly, treat an event that happened as having happened at a time different from the time it actually happened or involve particular entity action by an entity, whether or not the entity actually involved any action by the entity. Now, a bit tongue twister, I know, but I've had accountants say to me, oh, they never would invoke that. Well, the tax office assured people in 1981 that they would never, ever target any, any um, transactions other than blatant artificial or contrived. And of course, 1996 shows that has now changed. So what you can guess is whatever's written in stone, in concrete, is what is going to happen, okay? That is what's going to happen. And if the, if the power is given to someone to do something, that's potentially what is going to happen and what we should expect to happen. So, I put here very much, again, I'm not interested in, in saying, causing what I call a dishonourable revolution. It's about education. That's what the Academy is all about, for sure, is educating Australians in wealth building so we can make a difference in educating us in what's actually going on in society. So knowing how our laws work, knowing, knowing how things work, knowing that most government or presumed governments actually don't have authority. And at the very least, you should be asking questions. And not all legal notices or notices you get from a government authority are necessarily stuff you have to obey or obey in the form of a gift to you. And don't be afraid to ask questions. This is part of your tax asset protection. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid when you get a scary letter come to not just panic with fear and throw your hands up in the air and start taking Prozac, but to sit down, be objective, get some help if needed and say, I'm going to address this matter and I'm going to deal with it. When I get a parking fine, I always just sit down mulling it for a couple of days and think, right, is this fair? Am I happy to pay this or am I going to do action about this? And if I'm not going to do action, I'll just pay it. If I am, then I'll take action. If I get a notice from someone chasing money from me, what am I going to do with this? Is this money fair to be paid? Can I pay it right now? And it's about valuing yourself and valuing your assets and valuing your psychological worth because when, money's, when you're being chased for money, and I know more and more Australians are getting this all the time, and the methods of money collection are quite ruthless. The credit card companies go bang, bang, bang. I've helped many clients with handing credit cards, debts and being, being chased after. It's being able to be strong enough to say, well, no, 
um, I'll negotiate an arrangement and you'll be shocked. I had, I've helped a client recently who was being chased for quite a large credit card debt. We got them to agree to accept $10 per month for the next two years. $10 per month for the next two years. We've had, um, we've had ones um, like major credit cards like GE, NAB, all those kind of ones. Um, again, except $30 a month, whatever. So giving you time to get yourself back on your feet. So just because they're harassing you doesn't mean you don't have rights. In actual fact, when companies are harassing you for money, um, you actually have got a lot more power than you realise. Because if you show legitimate steps to pay it and into payment arrangements and it goes before court, courts will often say, well, hang on a sec. And banks don't want to go to court. A lot of people don't really want to go to court. They know it's going to cost them money. They know that there's a chance you might just go bankrupt anyway. So they're actually keen to settle with you. So part of it is just taking that authority, getting back control over your finances, getting things manageable to rebuild. And you can be very surprised how fast you can start to get your financial life and personal life back in order. One of the interesting things, and I've read this in a lot of stuff, and it's the order of creation, which we forget. God, however you see, God creates man, woman, who creates government, who creates persons. And what we tend to do is remember man created government. Government didn't create us, we created government. Very important to get that in us. They're called public servants. The servant means they serve us. Read the Constitution, Section 7, Section 24. We vote members of the, of the Parliament to go and represent us, not to represent Labour, Liberal or anyone else. They represent their electorate. But who do they represent today? Their parties. So they're basically factional parties. But the power we've actually got in our constitution, the power we've got in our legal things, and the power we actually have is quite amazing. And a lot of it's just mindset. I know now when I'm dealing with government people, whereas before when I was younger, I'd be scared of them. Now it's like, you're just a public servant, and I respect that, but you're a servant. You're here to serve us and administer law and order. I remember some time ago, I had a cop treat me appallingly, pulled me over, got up, ordered me out of the car, just because I didn't have a seatbelt on, basically said to me like Gestapo, stood there like this at me and said, hand over your license right now, young man, and I want to have a damn good look and a good excuse as to why you did not have your seatbelt on you. And I was so mad, to be honest. I just stood straight back at him and said, because it was hot. Because it was a hot day and I just didn't have my seatbelt on. And I just glared at him and we were eyeballing each other. And then he sort of backed off slightly and he said, look, you really should wear a seatbelt and he calmed down. I immediately lodged a complaint against him. I wrote a legal sort of letter straight into the police station about his conduct, had a senior sergeant come and see me, um, just talked out about it. I said, to be frank with you, I'm over it. But I said, I don't tolerate that kind of behaviour because I said, back, he could have done that to a frightened young person or whatever. I said, that's not the way. And he goes, no, we're really sorry. That shouldn't have happened. And he's actually admitted and confessed it. And um, he's agreed to demote himself um, for the time being to get himself back in order. So it's funny how when you just do something about things, you can actually make a difference. That's what you're dealing with a bank. Some of the deals that I've negotiated for clients and for myself, often surprise even my, uh, I've surprised myself. I didn't think I'd get them. I've just tried them on. So be aware that by being in your power and, and who you are and knowing that you've got these rights and learning your rights, you can become a very potent force in building your wealth and not just building wealth to fulfill your family's dreams and save your tax and protect your assets, but actually make a difference to help other people get their dreams too, which is really what life's about. So the solution is to be educated and empowered, know your legal rights, approach government or any authority with respect and honour, but with a mindset of authority and dominion. And certainly you want accountants who are proactive with the times and who will stand with you. So let's just finish off now. Thank you for listening. You've been a great group. So how can you build your wealth and secure it? Just a few myths. It's all too hard. I'll just pay a tax the ATO. It's my duty to pay my tax. Again, I have no problem paying tax. We live in a good country, but pay only what you legally have to. The biggest one I get, why spend money right now when I want to make money? I'll make some money first, then structure myself. Well, that sounds good, but let me ask you something. Have any of you ever built a house before? If you have, any of you ever thought, well, let's save money and let's ignore the architect's report and not worry about the foundation and let's just build it up and make it a bit cheap. No, you wouldn't even dream of it. Likewise, get proper advice at least and make sure that you structure yourself right or if it's not needed to be structured, at least you know that up front. 
So get advice, so right from day one, you're running your business like a business and not like just some little feasibility thing that you're just hoping works. Why protect my assets? After all, I want to keep a positive vibe. Won't I be more likely to attract an order if I'm focusing? Well, I say, I, when I've had people say it to me, I say, well, you have car insurance. Yeah, well, then isn't that being negative under your rationale? So in other words, yes, we keep positive, but in the, the day, the reality is, you know, we get cancer when we least expect it. The reality is we have car crashes and no one ever believed they were going to get one. We get sick and we didn't see it coming. So let's just make sure we're well secured in our assets and no one can touch them. It's all too much hard work. I just want to make money. I've had that one too. Well, if that's, if that's the mindset, um, there's going to be a few challenges ahead, but, but that will be learned because it is, it is hard work. It is a challenge to get yourself in order. It takes responsibility and takes focus. So what we do at 21st Century Accounting is we do do free 30 minute reviews to have a good look at your structures and help you out. So what you can do is one of our specialists goes through a no obligation look to help you structure your affairs to build wealth slash tax and miss scum make proof. If you want one of those consultations or see if you qualify for it, um, that's the number to call us on and that's the email to send across to us. We send you out a fact finder which you just complete some basic information and then we can go ahead and help you from there. We do do other work as well. The free consults often a great way just to at least find out what your needs are. We also do tax returns as well. And of course, we are, our accountants make sure they understand 21st century strategies. So rather than having an accountant who thinks you're talking hieroglyphics or ancient Chinese, they actually will understand when you talk about e-minis, options, or anything else that you're doing. What things do we offer? Well, as well as free consults, we've got paid consults on specific issues. We've got strategy designs as well, which is where we do a full overview of just your basic tax situation and we can come up with a basic outline or simple plan for you to move forward in your affairs. We've got company pa package. That's not just a company in trust. That's a lot more. That's doing strategy. That's going through stuff with you, really making sure you've got the right structure, um, helping you to make sure you get it, giving you mat materials to help you get it up and running and started. We do estate planning as well and which is bloodline wills starting from as low as 500 for simple wills we're up to 4,000 depending on the level of complexity of what you need. So a lot of things we can do with you. And I've mentioned about this special course which is just pretty much hot um, which just helps you as part of your asset protection and tax minimization to teach you basic things so you can stand up for yourself and no longer be at the mercy of bullies in the legal system or the corporate world. Who's interested in that? Yeah, so it'll teach you how to make sure that everything I talk to you about, you can actually start to stand in your strength and power and dealing with, with, with companies and with people. I've mentioned learn to deal with things like people chasing you for money, banks giving you a hard time, speeding fines, parking fines. The big one, your child being bullied at school, there's techniques you can do where you serve notices on the principal that will virtually stop that within 24 hours. Harassment in the workplace, dealing with business issues, collecting money from people and many other things and how to do it at low cost and not necessarily needing to get a lawyer involved, which is always great, I'm sure. So if you're interested in that one, um, again, just email us at the help at 21stca.com.au or contact us and we can organise it for you. Okay, so look, thank you very much and I look forward to seeing you prosper in what you're doing and look forward to seeing you sometime around 21st Century Accounting. And thank you very much.